Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Okay, folks, welcome to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. This is your co-host, Corey Groover, speaking. I know this is a voice that you guys aren't familiar with yet, but <clears throat> let me assure you, hopefully you will you'll be well acquainted with me moving forward into the future. But more importantly, I'm here to introduce our more common host to the podcast. <laughs> And the one that you're all here to hear, if he was a coon dog, he would have an all grand pedigree, Mr. Steven Fielder. Insert applause now. I like it <laughs> when you talk about common because you nailed it when you said <laughs> I'm the more common voice. <laughs> And oh. you talk about the grands. Yeah, I'm a grandpa. I got <laughs> grandchildren. So great grandson. Yeah, yeah. Right? Corey, I tell you what, buddy, we're, we're going to have to polish that intro a little bit. You need a little more excitement. Okay. All right. it. <laughs> hey, I thought that wasn't too bad for my. No, no, time. no, no. It's tolerable. <laughs> you should have heard the first one I introduced oh, years man. ago. But, uh, you know, with me speaking in. In, in a microphone was something that I did for years. In fact, even when I was a, a young person in my church at home, I used to be the uh, a worship leader. And, you know, I would lead the congregation in, in singing. Back in those days, it was hymns from a hymnal, from a the book. The good stuff. The good yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, so a mic in my face is not something that I'm intimidated by, and I know a lot of people wish that I were more so. <laughs> well, I can relate to that, Steve. I was a bass player in our uh, little youth group worship band that we had back in the day. So I had such long hair back then that uh, I couldn't see a microphone if it was in front of my face anyways. So well, I bet you and Alan Gingrich had some good times back at UKC. <laughs> I had got, Alan's an old hippie, too. You know, I mean, he and Paul. I think it was Paul was the brother that he was in a band yep. with and all that. So yeah, I tell you what, I'm in the my, presence of greatness here. My hair was so long back in the day. How long I, was it? Well, I'm going to tell you, it was so long. <laughs> that any time I put my bump cap on to go coon hunting, my hair would come straight down along the side of my head and would curl over the ridges of the bump cap. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of a little story. Surprise, surprise. Uh, before I went in the Air Force in 1969, I had uh, just gotten out of college, and the Air Force put me on a delayed enlistment deal. They had kind of a backup in their their uh, schedule, I guess, and whatever. But So it gave me a little bit of time to do some things, and my dad and I decided to take a trip down to Tennessee to the farm where he was raised and uh, spend a week or 10 days with my uncle, uh, my dad's younger brother. So one of the first things I needed to do when we got down there, this was in May, of course, there's a stream that flows through the farm there that we commonly call the creek. And uh, the one thing that you do when you go to the fielder farm is you go to the creek because it's uh, got some tremendous uh, smallmouth bass fishing in it. And uh, our or is known for its smallmouth bass fishing, so we love to do that. And and also, we went downtown to the local uh, hardware store there in Dixon, Tennessee, and uh, that's just about 30 miles west of Nashville on Interstate 40, for those of you who want a geography lesson along with your podcasting experience. But at any rate, we were in there, and the guy behind the counter, he was asking the questions, you know, my name, my age. And my uncle was standing there alongside or 
right nearby. And so when he got to the eyes are blue, he said hair. My uncle said long, and <laughs> <laughs> he was an old merchant seaman. Uh, you know, my dad's brothers. I I won't get into all that history, but. My, the younger brother was in the Navy. The older brother was in the Marine Corps. My dad was in the Army. So they were all military guys. and So they were always nice uh, short haircuts and all this. And here I show up, you know. I'm, I'm just a few days away from getting my locks shorn by the barber. <laughs> that, and basically ask everybody how you want it. You know, <laughs> and then oh, proceeds, proceeds to give you a buzz cut that <laughs> digs furrows down in your scalp with that hot clipper where he's been doing like a hundred other guys before you. But anyway, yeah. that's my hair story, guys. Um, so Corey was in a hair band, huh? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, music has always been a big part of my life. I've enjoyed it so much. My dad uh, was a fiddle player and uh, grew up there in that Tennessee uh, old-time fiddling barn dance culture, you know, as a kid. And then as I, when I got in high school, met a guy that moved into our town my senior year, Ron Vanover, and Ron was a picker, and so he showed me how to play rhythm guitar chords on the guitar that's about as far as i ever got with it but i enjoyed playing and i did so all through high school and college so you know and i i saw some writings by dave dean at one time and he had mentioned at the bellevue michigan club how he'd gotten together with todd kellum ukc and myself and somebody else and dave played a little did you ever play with dave Corey? Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Okay. But anyway, he was mentioning that. And and I know one time or two I took the guitar down to the tennis center at, at uh, in uh, Aurora. And, you know, when the cats were out, we had a little fun with that. And there remember. were other pickers, you know, along among the field reps that played a little bit. So, yeah, had a lot of I fun with it. I can remember in uh, actually during my interview that I had with UKC, um, I was in an interview with Todd Kellum and Alan Gingrich, and in walked Wayne Cavanaugh, who was the residing president of the United Kennel Club at the time. And uh, that was kind of an intimidating experience at first, you know. And uh, he came in and he said, I only got a couple questions for you. And one of those questions was, do you play an instrument? And I said, well, I was like, I, I, I do play an instrument. I pick a little bit of bass in my, my free time. And, you know, I've played in different bands and stuff like that. And he said, good, you're going to fit right in. We, we, we need a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> Put it, take it on the road, right? Yeah, exactly. So you guys were like Willie Nelson on the road again, yeah, running basically. up and down the road in that motor home, right? That was a pretty good impression of Willie. <laughs> that was good. I like that. I appreciate that. I do not have a giant doobie here, guys, while we're recording <laughs> this podcast. I, I do not partake of the left-handed cigarettes, just in case <laughs> anyone's asking. <laughs> But, uh, no, a lot of good times on the road on those trips, you know, uh, over the years at UKC. When I was there, we had Fred Miller liked his Winnebago's. Oh, yeah. And we had three different motorhomes in the time that I was there. And, uh, it, you know, and uh, we kind of used – we didn't actually stay in them. We never spent the night in, in those <laughs> motorhomes. We just used them for – a. Uh, office on wheels and a good place to take a nap while somebody else was driving. And, and of course, there was always the uh, endless snacks on, on board. And uh, or the stories I should tell, I should write a book about being on the road. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so many thousands of miles. The old, that Ford F-150 that's sitting out in my driveway right now has 200 and 80,000 miles on it. 
Wow. And almost all those miles had something to do. We're, we're, we're hauling a dog, oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, going hunting or fishing somewhere. But Well, Steve, I know that we're real glad that we can't see your odometer and see how many miles are... <laughs> On that my physical personal odometer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I tell you what, I'm feeling every single one of them these days. Uh, <laughs> I heard about the aches and pains all my life. Well, they're real, folks. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, man. Hey, what we got to talk about tonight, Corey? We're going to just sit here and and just dazzle this audience with our, our brilliant. Uh, uh, are we, as Bill O'Reilly used to say, we're just going to bloviate for well, I, an I hour we, and a half? I think we have a popular topic that's been requested numerous times that we're going to cover tonight. Um, we're going to hit on a few current events as well, uh, something that's relative to, to my neck of the woods specifically, and that is a piece of legislation that's an eerie word, legislation, for all of us coon hunters out there. Um, a piece of legislation that was introduced in, in the state of Pennsylvania, specifically Senate Bill 1087. Senate Bill 1087 was uh, a piece of legislation that was introduced that was going to limit the acts and privileges of hunting dog enthusiasts in the state of Pennsylvania. That's something that we've been keeping a pulse on here in the state for a while and we've gotten good news here in the in the past couple of days that uh, we're making headway with that so i just wanted to kind of make an announcement about that and uh, and kind of talk about that a little bit with you and see what you think well i got a phone call just before we uh, sat down to record today from my good buddy one of your um uh, friends and neighbors up there in Pennsylvania, Randy Smith. And I said, what you been doing, bud? And he said, I've been on the phone all day. And I said, what's going on? You selling puppies or what? He said, no, I'm uh, concerned, you know, about this bill that could, could basically put us out of business up here as hunters. Uh, and, of course, Randy, as we know, is a coon hunter and also a beagler. And... Uh, so he kind of let me in on what, you know, the bill and so forth, and we kind of talked about that. The way these things work, as I understand, uh, this bill was introduced. Uh, you probably got the names there in front of you, Corey. I do not. Uh, who was the senator that introduced this bill? Do you have it? One of the main senators that introduced it was, a, was Senator Rothman. Yeah, and it's he over east there. More more towards the eastern part of the state. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Sportsman's Alliance has gotten a hold of this, and uh, there's a bulletin out uh, by them talking about the bill. And as we're speaking here tonight, tomorrow will be uh, March the 19th. And I just remembered that that was my mother's birthday. And uh, mom's been gone a couple years now. But anyway, uh, he, there's a hearing tomorrow, it's, uh, uh, a committee hearing on this bill. And the concern, uh, the bill was, it's, a, it's one of these trespass bills that well-meaning but under- educated lawmakers tend to pick up and try to run with because they think it's going to give their constituents a, a, the warm and fuzzies uh, because it's going to address the sanctity of um, landowners and their ability to decide who and when others can enter upon their lands. Uh, and as it should be, there there definitely has to be some sort of control of one's uh, domain, so to speak, or domicile. And uh, so anyway, we fought these things for years. In my years at UKC and PKC, 
recreational trespass laws and so forth. And this one was particularly uh, concerning because it basically addressed a dog as a trespasser and the owner of the dog as a trespasser. You know, and as you explained to me earlier, Corey, and you might want to elaborate on this, in the state of Pennsylvania, while you don't have a right to retrieve law as such, you do have the privilege of going without a firearm, I guess, onto the land where your dog has has entered and retrieving that dog and getting back off. Is that pretty much the way it works? Yeah, so the way the way that it works here in the state of Pennsylvania is under existing law, there there is an exemption that is extended specifically to the owner of a hunting dog, in uh, that allows the owner of that hunting dog or you know, or the the handler of that hunting dog to enter onto posted property to retrieve said dog without explicit permission from the landowner themselves and the whole idea behind that exemption is we want to we want to prevent a problem from occurring before it happens so to speak so that is an exemption that came in through much of the purple paint law that entered the state with uh, probably within the last decade and that exemption has stood for for a long while now but the bill that's being introduced, Senate Bill 1087, would eliminate the hunter's ability to retrieve the dog and not only make it a felony, it would also criminalize the dog to a certain extent. If the dog was on the property um, without the landowner's explicit permission, then then there's just as much of a felony charge there as what it would be if you were just retrieving the dog. So luckily for us, a lot of us in the state and the different um, different sporting dog organizations and individuals have contacted their state representatives to try and communicate our concerns about the elimination of the exemption. And just at five o'clock today, I received notification uh, from Senator Rothman's office and Senator Rothman was the, the sponsoring uh, Senate delegate for this bill uh, that they were going to re not reinstate, but they were going to ensure that the exemption is is left intact for these different rules that exist. Okay, well, again, folks, you know we're coming to you on a Monday, uh, actually a week later. Uh, than this was recorded. So um, on Tuesday, which will be Tuesday past for those that are listening on Monday morning, uh, will be the hearing or, or the hearing has been held. And of course, at this point, we don't know what the outcome of that is. We hope that it's uh, positive all the way and this thing can just be killed in committee. Um, and that would be the end of it. I, I hesitate to say that because behind these kinds of bills, there's always the urging of groups like Humane Society of the United States, the, uh, you know, ASPCA, and various uh, animal rights. There's no such thing. That's an oxymoron. An animal cannot have rights without responsibilities. So, but at any rate, uh, we're going to, uh, here's what I would caution listeners about this bill. Watch it. Uh, what's the bill number again, Corey? 1087, Senate Bill 1087. Okay. Go online, look the bill up. See who the sponsors are. You should, if you're under the sound of my voice in the state of Pennsylvania, you should know who your senators are. And you definitely, like my buddy Randy Smith, need to be calling that senator. And any of the members, you can look. And I, do you know what committee this is in, Lord uh, 
Corey, does it say? Uh, Senate Game and Fisheries Committee. Okay. So you can go online in the state of Pennsylvania and look up that the committee members on that uh, committee, and it will give you all their contact information, their emails, or whatever. You need to contact each member of that committee. Now, I would caution you to go ahead and do that assuming that this thing has uh i won't say it's been will have been voted out of committee uh by the time you're listening to me but it may still be active so if you care about your ability to hunt with a coon hound or a beagle or a bird dog or a retriever or a feist squirrel dog or any kind of hunting animal, hunting dog in the state. If you, you're a bird hunter that likes to hunt woodcock and grouse, uh, as I said, waterfowl hunters, all of us are painted with the same brush here. So learn about this bill, look it up, read it, contact your, rep, your senator and let them know that you, you know, disapprove of this, that it's unnecessary, that you have laws in place already to deal with this. And, you know, the thing that bothers me, I heard uh, Randy told me today that he was assured by Rothman's, am I getting that right, Rothman? Rothman? Yes. Okay. Rothman's office that the dog language is, is being taken out of this bill. Well, my immediate question was, well, what about the human that's hunting the dog? You know, is he still affected by this trespass? How can he go and retrieve his dog? Maybe the dog's not going to be charged. What are they going to do uh, to the dog and incarcerate the dog? I doubt yeah. it. But the human that's attached to the other end of the leash well, is and, the one that we're concerned about. And I might extend that thought in in the regard of, um, you know, it's important to contact your state representatives to make them aware of your presence within the state and to make them aware of the traditions that exist within your state. Uh, I might even extend that to include contacting the Pennsylvania Game Commission themselves. Um, obviously, this is a Pennsylvania game uh, commission related committee that's being held or, or hearing that's being held. And they'll, and obviously, they're going to be involved with that conversation. And one thing that I can say about the bill is I'm pretty confident that this is, an, this is just simply an oversight. That's at least what I'm hoping that, uh, that this whole brigade is, you know, as far as uh, removing the, the, the hunting dog exemption specifically. Um, Pennsylvania has always been a place of opportunity for sportsmen, and it's always been a place of well-rounded sportsmen on top of that. So even, even the people who enjoy deer hunting or turkey hunting, um, to a large extent, like we do hound hunting, they may have experience with hound hunting directly. Or they may they may dabble on it with friends or, or anything like that. So it's not that I don't think this is a specific target towards houndsmen and their ability to do what they love to do. Um, I certainly hope that's the case. So I'm hopeful that everything will go smoothly in this hearing. Well, we always are hopeful, but let me play the old cynic here for a minute. The state of Pennsylvania doesn't have a bear season with hounds. Correct. And that's been successfully uh, defeated, you know, over the years or held at bay, so to speak. I <laughs> like that. That's there. pretty yeah, cool. Like that. <laughs> and and uh, so there is an element there that doesn't get the warm fuzzies when they think about hound hunting. So we need to be aware of that at least. And Something that I used to say uh, as I address groups all over the country, 
I would say that any time there is a town council meeting, a county commission meeting, a legislative committee meeting, such as what we're talking about, that will be conducted on um, March 19th there in Pennsylvania, there is the opportunity for somebody to introduce a, a bill, an ordinance, uh, a, a regulation that can put us out of business. And so vigilance is, you, I can't overstate the importance of being vigilant. Our friend Clay Newcomb, uh, with the media organization, use the term guard the gate. Yep. And uh, we have to guard the gate, and we have to be vigilant, constantly watching. And believe me, when you defeat, defeat these people, they'll spring right back with something else. So <laughs> it's an ongoing thing, but the question we all have to ask ourselves is, are these hounds worth it? It's a sport yeah. that we love worth it. it. Is it worth fighting for? Or are we going to be just fine when the law gets passed that says we can't do what we love to do? And well, I think and to, we all uh, to, know that answer. And to a greater extent, this this is um, basically the state calling our bluff, you know, and the fact that we have to assume ownership of our sport and our traditions. And if we aren't willing to do that, then yes, they will go by the wayside. And yes, other people will make decisions for us, whether we like it or not. So as much as we like the trophies, as much as we like going to the club and participating in events, as much as we like raising a beautiful litter of puppies, we have a responsibility to step up to the plate when these sorts of situations arise. And it's not enough to just sit back and give support to those who are speaking about it on your behalf. It takes, it takes a multitude of voices to be heard. Absolutely. And it's so easy for us now, you know, just go Google, use that magic Google machine and Google that bill and, and uh, look up the contact information and pick up the phone or shoot an email, okay? And, um, you know, my friend Randy asked me if I would write a letter in, you know, stating uh, our position there. And I told him I would do that. And, you know, we all can do something, Okay. We all can do something, and it's easy for us now. It's right there um, on the screen in front of us. So anyway, we're going to stop beating that horse tonight, but we hope, or today, but we hope that you will uh, take action on behalf of my sport, Corey's sport, and ultimately your own sport, and voice your opinion that you are opposed to Senate Bill 1087. 1087. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> okay, Corey, you and I were kind of bumping around talking about this and that around this hot stove today and um, about what we wanted to talk about with our audience and we've been kind of kicking this one around for a while that we might get into some breed discussions, uh, the various breeds of dogs. And, you know, we all kind of pick one usually that we like and we kind of stick with it over the years. Uh, everybody knows that mine is the plot breed and uh, I got to put in a shameless plug Thank you to the American Plot Association this past weekend at their breed days for voting uh, our boy Fever, Bear Pin Fever, as Coon Dog of the Year. Man, that made me proud. And yeah, I was uh, especially. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you, bud. And I was especially 
uh, proud and glad and appreciative of my buddy, Mark Miller, who has done 100% of the work with that little dog. And, uh, and he likes him. They're a great team together. And uh, they had a lot of fun. They played all the games. They did tree and contests and water races and field trials and, and a night hunt. And, uh, I think he totally <laughs> wore himself. Mark did Friday. Yeah. <laughs> it rained all day. And he said, man, I'm not going to woods tonight. I'm wore out fighting this. <laughs> and fever's Woo. not easy because when you get him around games to play, man, he goes into, uh, I mean, he is wound like a $2 oh, watch, boy. you know. <laughs> so it, it's, I'm sure Mark been. <laughs> Keeping him lassoed all week, all all day was was more than he wanted to to deal with. But anyway, uh, had a great time there. Mark did, and he uh, everybody that was there reported that they really had a good time. And I think I saw online somewhere that the gate they do charge a gate going in, and I think it was over seventeen hundred people that went through the gate and paid the fee there. Wow. Uh, so that was a pretty nice event there. That sure is. Greenville, Tennessee. Hats off to the American Plot Association and everybody that works. There's one guy there in that association that is just a workhorse. And, I mean, he he's always involved in, in doing things. And a greater guy you will never meet in this sport, Gary Bowen from Virgilina, North Carolina. I hunted with Gary several times when I lived in Raleigh. He is just a tremendous guy and a very hard worker. I know Gary wouldn't want the credit for anything, but I, from me to you, Bo, you're doing a great job down there, and I, I appreciate it so much. All right. We decided that we were going to talk about a breed of dogs that really was probably the oldest coonhound breed uh, registered by UKC, I believe it was. Uh, but it was certainly one of the three original breeds uh, way back in 1898 when they started registering dogs there in, in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Funny story, Corey, I don't know if you heard it, but Chauncey Bennett, the founder of UKC, he put the address as Chicago, Illinois, and then the the mail was came over on a on the train from uh, Chicago to Kalamazoo because he didn't feel like anybody would want to do business with a registry founded or headquartered in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He no thought kidding. Chicago sounded a lot more uptown, <laughs> and he may have been competing with. AKC, of course, being in New York City. So, but anyway, sure. <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about black and tans, aren't we? Yeah, the breed of first impressions because they were, in fact, first in many of the different registries that uh, are currently registering purebred dogs. Yeah, when I went to you, AKC, uh, when you talked about coon hounds, there was only one breed. And that was the American Black and Tan Coonhound. Yes, sir. That was a Coonhound. End of story. You know. And I I can remember the days uh, the days I spent showing in AKC confirmation shows uh, when I was a kid, and that was the only Coonhound breed that was recognized at the time. That would have been early two thousands. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was my job when I went to AKC in two thousand four was to bring those other breeds, those UKC breeds, into full recognition with AKC. And thankfully, and the good Lord's help and a lot of other folks, too, we were able to accomplish that uh, before I uh, retired in 2010, so, uh, or 2011, actually. Well, the black and tan coon hound, of course, you know, they called him the old glory hound. Um, they, he was the, was the, the companion dog of the settlers, you know, that headed west in the wagon trains and all of that and went across what was called the Darby Plains of Ohio. And, uh, 
the black and tan, you know, was a trail hound, of course, and I'm sure it, he originated from the English and Irish and French hounds. I'm sure the mixture of, of those breeds, you know, that came over with the colonists to this country. And uh, so anyway, he's been around for a long, long time. I wrote a ch uh, an essay in my book uh, and talked about the first time I went to a, a field trial and hearing these black and tans coming up over the hill with their long balls and well <laughs> behind all the greyhound mixes and all that that came through on the on the field trial drag, you know, way ahead of them. But faithfully, they came right on through and treed on the tree. So it's uh, it's, it's fun tough. to think back about those old dogs because uh, they were, in many cases, the origin of uh, of coon hunting in the U.S. prior to the Walker, you know, bursting on the scene. Yeah, they really they really paved the way for the rest of the breeds to to come on through, you know, in, in a professional sense, but also in a holistic sense. You know, they being the first breed of coonhound that was recognized by many of these different registries. Um, you know, a lot of people in the purebred dog sports didn't have experience with coonhounds, or at least owning them. And the black and tan breed is certainly a professional breed in the fact that the people that promote these dogs are always professional. They're always industry leaders. They're 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 very much commonplace in many of the national level competitions that you're going to see, whether that's in the show ring or in the woods. So they are a breed of extreme integrity, and they're very much well represented and well worth talking about for that reason. Oh, for sure they are, and uh, you know I I've got. A lot of reference material and <laughs> rattled in various places. I, I go to my friend David McKee down in South Carolina, go to his home, and he's got a whole room in his house that's a library with shelves like a library full of hunting volumes and all. And I, I wish I had all my magazines and, and publications. Um, organized that way but i've been through a few moves and when we downsized and came to florida and i now live in a retirement community i don't have the luxury of having a lot of extra room for that sort of thing but i have managed to hold on to those things and uh you know i don't know where i would be without friends and i'm sure most of you out there feel the same way but i've got a book here and uh i'm showing it to you here Corey. it's uh all about black and tans and it was written by bill boatman and ej ralston now boatman many people know about because of his dog supply and hunting supply business in bainbridge ohio he was the number one for many many years before people like uh John Wick, for instance, burst on the scene. But there were a lot of dog supply houses uh, around the country. And when Full Cry and American Cooner were published, they all advertised in those magazines. But this book, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about this book. Uh, there is a, a signature here on the first page it says, to my good friend, Holman Fielder. Now, listeners will know that was my dad. May your journey to the happy hunting ground be filled with God's richest blessings. And then he says, E.J. Ralston, May 8th, 1978. And then he gives a Bible verse reference, which I did not look up. But it's Proverbs 12, 27, and 28. You want me to read that for us? Yeah. Okay. The lazy man does not roast game, 
But diligence is man's precious possession. In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. That's beautiful. That's neat. That's neat. Um, Junior Ralston was a unique individual. And uh, I guess to rewind the tape just a little bit, uh, Bill Boatman was a black and tan fancier. He loved his black dogs. And he kind of went on a quest to go out and buy as many good stud dogs and good black and tans as he could. But he knew that he did not have the personal, uh, perhaps the time or the network in the black and tan breed that ever uh, Ralston had. Now, let me read real quick this little bio, and you'll get the idea of who uh, E.J. Ralston was. Everett Ralston is known by the nickname Junior to coon hunters in many states. He began coon hunting in 1941 in southwestern Indiana. He was from over around Terre Haute, Indiana, is where he was from. His school bus driver was a coon hunter and would tell Junior what time he'd pick him up that night for a coon hunt. After a 20-year career as a sales representative of the Hallman Company of Terre Haute, Indiana, Junior entered the Appalachian Bible Institute at Bradley, West Virginia, where he earned a bachelor's degree in May of 1978. Okay, Bill Boatman wanted Junior Ralston because of his network of, of black and tan hunters, and Junior had been very active. Uh, in fact, well, this is kind of funny. My father and I were sitting on the porch in Beckley, West Virginia. West Virginians are notorious porch sitters, <laughs> especially after dinner. <laughs> Supper, excuse me. Yeah, there you go. And we were sitting there as I was on a, uh, I'm not sure, I, I may have been living in Beckley at that time shortly after I came home from the military. And then I moved up to Eastern Ohio uh, for a period of time with my job. But anyway, we were sitting there and a car pulled up in front of the house. And this fella got out and he walked up the walk and he says, is this the Fielder residence? And uh, one of the other of us acknowledged that it was. And he introduced himself as Junior Ralston. Well, immediately, that name jumped off the pages of Full Cry and American Cooner magazine because I'd been reading stories about Junior and his exploits with his black and tan dogs, you know, for many years. And so I immediately recognized him, and he was quite surprised that we knew who he was. But anyway, that opened a friendship at that time. He was still in college there in our town, and I hadn't known that at all up until that point. So anyway, as the years went on, then Junior and I got to, you know, to be very close and corresponded a lot and saw each other at the events and and uh, was really uh, saddened when I heard that Junior had passed away. But anyway, he and Bill Boatman got together and wrote this book all about black and tans and it's a it's a good one it and then on the cover it says old bruiser it shows a black and tan male here on the tree <laughs> and it says old bruiser tree and cover story is on page four uh and boys and girls if you'll turn to page four in your all about black and tans. The dog that he was calling Bruiser was indeed night champion Eads Black Bruiser. Was born November 11th, 1964. That was the year that I graduated high school. And lived 13 years, two months, and 16 days. Now remember that, kiddies. There's going to be a pop quiz. 
<laughs> Lee Eads, a well-known coon hunter, owned his sire and started Bruiser on his rise to fame. Now That's here's quite another the name for a black and tan Bruiser. Bruiser. That's a good yeah. name for one. It is, isn't it? Yeah. The old guys, they knew how to name these dogs, man. They oh. put some character in them, you know? Yes, they did. And here's another famous uh, black and tan man back in that era. So black and tans were quite popular in uh, in Ohio and in Kentucky. Uh, but he says here, Ivan Clark later owned Bruiser before selling him to Owen Bowman. Now, I met Ivan Clark and Owen Bowman through Junior Ralston at Black and Tan Days. When I went to UKC in 1983, Black and Tan Days was one of the largest coonhound events that we held. It was bigger than Walker Days. Uh, it was, if not bigger, almost as big as the Texas State Championship, which was a leader back in those days, in the early 80s. So we're talking about here, right right here, Lee Eads. Lee was a famous black and tan man. His brother, Duel Eads. And I believe, Corey, if I'm not mistaken, Daryl, was either a son or a grandson of one of these guys. And Daryl Eads uh, made some noise, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Specific, uh, <laughs> specifically the phrase, Yata Hey. I remember that. Uh-huh. <laughs> he used, uh, when um, back in 2000, at the 2015 UKC World Hunt, I was, I was at, in attendance at that hunt. And uh, actually, we had two black and tans that made the final cast that year, made the final four. And uh, Daryl Eads was one of those guys with a dog he called Big Slick. And Daryl used to yell, Yata Hey. It, I don't remember. I don't remember what it meant or where it came from or why he said it, but he used to yell that. And he was yelling that in the woods that night. Too, I'm so. going to take a stab at that. Okay. The old saying, what the heck, you know, what the heck's going on, mm -hmm. later was kind of evolved into what the hey, <laughs> what the hey, Corey, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, it's now weird. it's gone to its lowest depths, you know, and sure, and all. But I imagine that's what Daryl was saying, what the heck, guys, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's quite possible. But anyway, here, getting back, uh, so, you know, these were all guys, Ivan Clark, Owen Bowman, uh, were guys that Junior Rawson introduced me to as being fellows that really knew the black and tan hound and, uh, and you know, hunted a better class of black dog. And, uh, of course, this is, you know, they uh, were there, in the times of guys like uh, Joe Bloodworth, a dog named Black Bill. That's a great uh, historic name uh, that black and tan fanciers will remember. But anyway, this little story of Bruiser, and we'll move along. Bruiser was bought by Bill Boatman as the prepotent hound near 12 years of age. So Bill thought that Bruiser was prepotent. In other words, we use that term to describe a dog that you could breed to a collie and he'd produce a tree dog. You know, I mean, <laughs> that was a common, common thing. He headed Wildwood Kennels, and that was the name of Bill Boatman's kennel, until he passed on to the Happy Hunting Grounds. His offspring continued to influence the great black and tan breed and undoubtedly will for many years. Coon hunters in many states hunt and proudly own his progeny. So there's a look back at a black and tan hound. And a couple of guys, you know, that were really dyed in the wool, black and tan fanciers. And they wrote this book, and, and the book is, uh, is, is you know, 
chapter one is early history. I would advise you guys, if you can find this on eBay or somewhere, see if you can get a copy, because it really is a good read, especially if you like the black dogs. And it I'm talks about it. Go it. ahead. I'm definitely going to look for it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, he, the chapters go early history. And then this is an interesting thing because it does kind of bring us where we are today, or at least it's the beginning of the evolution, if you will, of the black and tan hound from the uh, uh, long-eared, uh, slow-trailing, heavy-bodied, deep-chested, deep-voiced, original black and tan to what for many years was called the medium-eared black and tan. And this uh, introduction here about the formative years will explain that, and I'll read it in just, just a minute. Coon hunters have always taken great pride in owning the best dog in their area. When black and tans were being developed, communications were limited. While hunters knew one another within a county or a few counties, only a few of them sought hounds from other areas. To those who did the searching, the rewards were great. One such black and tan man was J.F. Hans, H-A-N-S, or Hans, Wagner, first at Newton and later at Waterloo, Iowa. The Hans Wagner hounds were featured in old mag an old magazine, Hunter, Trader, Trapper, back as far as 1912. Man, that's a long time ago. It sure is. Okay. Anyway, he talks about Hans Wagner's mother was from an old Southern family. The Cheeks were their names. And as a child, he heard his mother relate how her grandpappy went bear hunting in the mountains of Tennessee and was never heard of again. Whew, that's pretty rough. Uh, his father, grandfather, and even great-grandfather were woodsmen, houndsmen, and horsemen. One of Hans' earliest recollections is being lifted over the old rail fences by his father on some coon hunts. So they go ahead and talk about Hans Wagner. Now, Hans Wagner was a real colorful guy. He was a window dresser by trade, meaning that he was employed by department stores to uh, create the window dressings for their stores, people. The term window shopping would walk by and see what the latest and greatest uh, furniture or clothing or whatever but anyway, he ran these fantastic ads in Full Cry Magazine and, and in the, uh, Bloodlines, uh, which was a forerunner of Coonham Bloodlines. And so there's a there's basically a chapter here about hands and the formative years, you know, with uh, with the black and tan. So that's uh, that's. If you hear about the Wagner bred black and tans, um, I'm going to have to kind of get back into my memory here. The fellows out in Iowa that kind of carried that on. One of them was a field rep for us at one time, and his son, Marshall White. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Marshall White kind of carried on the uh, Wagner bred uh, coonhounds and his son as well. Uh, for quite some time. So anyway, great old book about black and tan coon hounds. And uh, I mentioned Joe Bloodworth, and he was famous for the Bloodworth ear canker remedy that was advertised in Full Cry and American Cooner for many, many years. So... Uh, a lot of history with the black and tan breed. And and Junior went ahead, you know, and found several good dogs and brought them to uh, Bill Boatman's kennel. And then they were advertised and promoted, you know, across, across the country. 
But man, there's some beautiful, beautiful hounds in here, and uh, just a, a, a real good read uh, for history buffs. All about black and tans. Bill Boatman and E. J. Ralston. What say is, you, Corey? That is some really great history. Yeah. It's, it's nice when you can get the real specific stuff. You know, not all this general mamsy pansy stuff that you might read on the internet. How to raise and train a black and tan. Available <laughs> at your local pet store. <laughs> Chapter one. Get this is a cool. leash. A feet bowl, <laughs> so and see, a water bucket. Okay. How much, so, how much experience with the black and tan breed do you have personally? Ah, uh, well, the first coon dog that I remember my dad having was a grade black and tan, and I think our listeners know what I, we mean when we say grade. That was. A dog that was not registered and typically crossbred. Uh, my dad was a pipe fitter, and the first year that I was in school was in. Uh, I went to school in the state of Missouri. My dad was working at Kevill, Kentucky, across the river. It was right where the Ohio River enters the Mississippi, and uh, across the river from what's now become a ghost town, <laughs> Cairo, Illinois. But anyway, we lived in Charleston, Missouri, and there was a local coon hunter, a barber there, whose name last name was Dudley, not to be confused with Dudley Do-Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, when my dad moved back to West Virginia, he had... Uh, gotten two puppies from this barber and one of them was black and tan but he had white stocking feet and some white in his chest the other was coal black and looked more like a lab and these dogs were crossed black and tan blue tick and bird dog and uh, anyway dad named his Sam and Sam was the first coon dog that I remember we having. And then if you look on the cover of my book, On to the Dogs, A Coon Hunter's Journey, there's a picture of me when I was about 11 or 12 years old holding a plot pup and a black and tan female named Kate. Now, Kate was also a gray dog and had some white in her chest. So my earliest beginnings, you know, were with black and tans. But back in that day, most of the black and tans that I knew of that were being used for coon hunting were crossbreds uh, because the old line black and tans, those old-fashioned long-eared dogs, weren't fast enough for the emerging coon hunter of the 50s and 60s uh, or when the competition coon hunters and coon hunts were emerging at that time and of course that was you know the era of the walker dog coming to the uh, you know into uh the sport and a lot of the older guys like me if you talk to them they'll talk about the fact that there weren't many walker dogs around back in those days yeah, you know, it's really interesting, especially when I talk to a lot of um, the older fellas, not to insult you, Steve, but um, a lot of the older fellas that used to coon hunt in my area back in the day, a lot of them talk about having black and tan coon hounds. And actually, um, my dad has a cousin who had a really close relationship with, with my grandfather and he did a lot of coon hunting with him, and he and he got it himself into dogs. And he hunted black and tans for a good long while. And, and specifically, um, if I can remember, he had uh, he had at least one female that went back to the old screaming eagle dog, which is still uh, talked about stud from from recent history in the, in the black and tan breed. But 
Yeah, a lot of these old guys had black and tans in their backyards. Well, when I began my competition career, if you want to call it that, hunting in the night hunts, quite often I would go to southwest Virginia to towns like Christiansburg or Tazewell or Marion or uh, Bland and those those uh, those towns, those clubs. The prominent figure in coon hunting in that era was a guy named W. L. Davis, commonly called Willie Davis. And Willie was known for his black and tan dogs. And you mentioned Midnight Screaming Eagle. Screaming Eagle was uh, one of uh, Willie's stud dogs. And he had several. And Willie was one of the first guys to make the uh, coon jacket, the monogram jacket. I called them billboards. Uh, popular because when Willie walked in the clubhouse, of course, Willie was a a very charismatic guy. I mean, everybody knew Willie, and when he came in the room, it was he was loud, he was laughing, he was joking, he was, uh, you know, Mister Coon Hunter for that area. <laughs> era in that area well, and uh it's and funny. so black pardon Go ahead. oh i was just gonna say it's funny that you bring up uh willie specifically um i just happened to have an issue of um the world the black and tan issue of coonhound bloodlines from 2008 which would have been the april issue and uh the they uh, they have articles from the coonhound bloodlines archives in that particular issue and the topic of conversation is willie davis and <laughs> how and about it, that and it actually has a lot of good pictures you're here. checking up on me aren't you i'm oh, trying to verify well um, as 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 uh former president trump would put it i'm fact checking yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right okay uh, yeah willie davis was indeed a very colorful guy. And there was another guy in our area named Gene Joyce that hunted uh, black and tans and hunted some good dogs. And, and I mentioned before, and in fact, I saw it here. And I also have from the archive here in front of me a copy of the 1972 uh, black and American Black and Tan Coonhound Association yearbook, and in there uh, I saw a, an article, and if I can find that real quick, about a guy named Elwood Ferguson. Now, Elwood was from Virginia, and uh, he he was well known uh he had a dog named Thunder Bill. He had one named uh, True Bill. And these were dogs that kind of, they had the uh, Bloodworth breeding. And he was a uh, well-known black and tan man in that era. Uh, let me see if he says here about when he started. Okay. He said, I was listening to older hunters tell of how a coon could outsmart a dog and get away. If the dog could catch him, what a fight you would see. In the year 1939, a friend told us that he had seen some coon tracks down on the river. So that strong desire to coon hunt led me to catch that coon. Anyway, he goes ahead and tells the story of that and it. These old stories, man, they light my fire. I don't know what today's coon hunter is going to talk about when they get older. Are they <laughs> going to talk about how they chased John Strickland for two miles through a freshly sown wheat field with their boots 
feeling like they weighed 30 pounds each. I don't <laughs> know what they're going to talk about. Well, but before, I love listening or reading these old stories about these hunts back in the day. Well, before we get off the topic of uh, W.L. Davis or Willie Davis. Okay, yeah. Um, I have a fun fact for you, and you might know this, you might not. But I, but I'm just being made aware of this. Did you know that W.L. served as the president of the United English Breeders and Fanciers Association at one point in time in his life? I did know that for sure. And now I will ask you a trivia question. Oh boy! What was the name of the famous English stud dog that W.L. Davis owned and hunted and advertised. I can't read that, Steve. Oh, man. Well, it's not jumping off the page at me, so I guess you're going to have to tell me. Rawhide. You remember the TV show, Rawhide? I do remember that. Yeah, man. Roll so, them, roll them, so roll them. I got that piece of information <laughs> from this issue of Coonhound Bloodlines. There's actually a really cool photo here. It's a photo yeah. of Bill Wick, Wickham. Wickham, my Bill Wickham, good friend. Who was the president of the National Plowhound Association Correct. at that time. Lee Crawford, who, as many of you probably know, was the president of of the Tree and Walker Breeders and Fanciers Association. And a gentleman extraordinaire. Yes. And uh, and our friend, W.L. Davis, who was not only a, pl- a black and tan aficionado, apparently he was a uh, full-fledged fancier of the English Coonhound breed. So that's pretty cool that three men repre- representing four different breeds in that photo. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, that that's true, and, and it took a guy like Willie to pull that off. Oh, sure. He had a bigger than life personality, <laughs> and, and you know, and he would just, you know, that kind of stuff would just just <laughs> roll off his back. I'm going to tell a story that's probably not going to paint coon hunting in the greatest of light. Okay, I'll allow and it. thanks. Thank goodness the sport has evolved since those days, or at least I think it has, <laughs> and I hope it has. I was at a hunt in Marion, Virginia. The late Dean Testerman listeners will remember Dean very well. He was a good friend of, of Willie's. And Dean was every bit as colorful and loud. He had a real gruff voice. He was a walker man through and through and was very active with the Southeastern Tree and Walker Association, was a bench show judge and all. But anyway, it was down at Dean's Club in Marion, Virginia. I'd gone out on a night hunt that night. Don't remember whether it did any good or not. My dad was with me. Those were the may have been the days, and I'm sure they were, before I was old enough to drive. Uh, my dad would drive me to the hunts. At the club that night, sitting along the tables, the tables were formed in long lines, as they sometimes are in coon clubs, where it's uh, these eight-foot tables end to end to end. So, you know, you sit there and you're likely sitting across from somebody else or whatever. You sit there and have your breakfast or your coffee or whatever. A gentleman, and I use that term <laughs> loosely, <laughs> had been visiting the local uh, provider of the recipe for that area. Uh, let's say he was uh, not slightly, but well oiled when he came through the door. He was inebriated, he was drunk. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> and he walked in the clubhouse door, and he was unhappy with the results of one of the casts. And there was a gentleman sitting there, right, I was just sitting right nearby, 
And I felt I always remember this guy, and I won't use his name. I believe that he's passed on. Anyway, he was, as coon hunters were apt to do in that day, he was wearing Carhartt bib of bibbed overalls. And he had both hands inside the bib of his coveralls. And he was sitting there at the table. And this gentleman, I always remember the guy, had on a sport coat, which is kind of unusual at a coon club, right? Sure, yeah. And this guy wasn't all that big. But <laughs> I'll try to make this short, but it was so funny and yet not. <laughs> The guy came across the table from where this fellow was sitting and apparently made a negative reference, well, no apparent about it, I heard it, about this guy Hunter's mother. Ooh. So you kind of know the term he used when he addressed this hunter. The hunter did not say a word. He simply eased the chair that he was leaning back on back to the ground, rose in a single motion as he retrieved his right hand from the bib of his overalls and launched himself forward and caught said gentleman right on the point of the chin with a fist that looked like a sledgehammer. <laughs> Said gentleman went airborne <laughs> backwards and hit the concrete floor and his head smacked the floor two or three times before it stopped bouncing. Ooh. Very alarming, very scary for me. Sure. Okay. It made an impression on me. But being the good fireman that he was, immediately Willie Davis sprang into action, did CPR on this guy, uh, uh, mouth to mouth, the whole nine yards, and the guy got up off the floor and walked away. Wow. That's one of the things I remember about Willie. That is a scene that I hope never, ever gets replayed at a coon hunting club again. And I told my dad that night on the way home, I said, Dad, I didn't like that. And I don't ever want to be around that again. And if that's the way this, you know, it's going to be, I'm not going to go anymore. Of course, my dad and his wisdom. My dad was totally fearless. I mean, he was, sure. and, you know, he didn't make any remark much about it at all. But he assured me that that was not normal behavior and that wasn't going to happen, you know, at best. But I'll never forget that, that night. Uh, <laughs> not recommended, boys and girls. You know, but that's a memory of W.L. Davis that I'll always have. And I'll tell you one other little W.L. Davis thing. When Fred Miller was inquiring about hiring me, you mentioned when you went to UKC and Wayne Cavanaugh uh, was there. And, you know, when Wayne, uh, apparently when Fred, and he told me this himself, Fred did, he said when he inquired about me with from Willie Davis, who he knew, Willie very well uh, and he said uh, you know what about this guy and uh, Willie told him he said well he's a hillbilly <laughs> but, this is a funny part oh, but he's okay. a but he's a sophisticated hillbilly <laughs> <laughs> what well, Fred got a big laugh out of that and he told oh, me later man. that Willie said that about but my good friend Lindell Price uh, and Willie hunted together many years, and he would have so many Willie Davis stories. And Bob Justice, who was a guest on my podcast before, the coon hunting barber from Christiansburg, Virginia, had a lot of Willie Davis stories, yeah. uh, you know. 
Uh, what well, a colorful Christian, character. Christiansburg, Virginia, I think was the place that photo was taken that we were referring to. With, I don't, um, I don't doubt that it was. Lee Crawford yeah. and yeah. Well, so we've covered the gauntlet, I think, as far as, as uh, a history lesson goes. Let's talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the in the current era with black and tan coon hounds specifically. What's going on with them? Well, for one thing, uh, they're they're re- resilient. Uh, you know, I don't think the love for the black and tan coon hound has has waned at all. And when I went to White River in 2010 for my first trip there, I was the only guy in camp that was hunting a dog other than a black and tan. Uh, Nubbin Moore, my longtime friend, he hunted black dogs for years. Mr. Fred Sanford was a black dog man. Kenneth Raines, who was there in camp, hunted black dogs. Frog Hayes was hunting black and tans. And and their buddy, uh, Mike Crockett, out there in Senatobia, Mississippi, has bred. He's famous for the Newt dog and all some a lot of dogs uh, that came down out of that line. So the Black and Tan and Chad McCoyne up in, I believe, in Illinois or Indiana, I, I'm not sure which, is producing some terrific dogs. Uh, my good friend Randy Smith from Mississippi hunts Black and Tans has had some really good ones. Uh, I, I hated this week I saw that a dog named Mule that Randy, ha- I believe he got uh, Mule from Chad and trained him out and sold him to Jamie Perrin. And then Jamie sold him to, uh, uh, I think it's Bobby Talley, is it? Uh, anyway, the partner of Bruce Gillum. Uh, and Bruce has been hunting this dog named Mule, a really nice black and tan. I was sitting in the in the lodge after the hunt one night when a big old stack of Benjamins were exchanged hands between Randy Smith and Jamie Perrin for old, for Mule. But I don't know what happened to Mule, but the dog died this week. Oh. I don't know if it was a, a car accident or what. I don't know the details. I wish I did. But anyway, the black and tan breed is, is doing extremely well. Micah Ayers there in Kentucky, uh, the the gentleman we commonly call Flop. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> he hunts black dogs. Uh, there's just been, you know, they, they've done exceptionally well, and, and there's a some black dogs that have, have made it to the big show and done real well too. Yeah, we were talking so, about that earlier. So uh, just a little fun fact for everybody. This is going to make Steve feel old. I really enjoy making him feel old. I was born. <laughs> you in, don't have to do <laughs> a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I was born in 1993. So that was 30 years ago. Wow. So I just went through the list of um, UKC show champions. UKC, well, I should rephrase that. UKC world show champions since 1993. 15 black and tan coon hounds made that list, whether they were a world show champion or they filled the res- uh, the reserve spot or the opposite sex spot. Um Wow, at, that's strong. At, at, yeah, that that's some representation right there. I mean, they're they're sharp looking dogs as it is, but you get a quality black and tan up there on the bench, man, and they're just they're hard mm. to look away from. Um, but we also have uh, since 1993, we have two black and tans that have actually won the world hunt, and oh, I yeah. think. And I think that you are from very familiar with uh, the dog from the 1995 World Hunt specifically. So, oh yeah, that was uh, Randy Samuelson and Jeff Nelson. Jeff was a handler from Illinois, and the uh, J and R Northern Buck Two dog. Uh, we had a great uh, World Championship that year in South Boston, Virginia. And uh, Buck Two was our first black and tan uh, world champion at UKC. And uh, 
did a great job and and uh, of course I think all all the uh, the uh, black and tan fanciers around the country were <laughs> glad to see a black dog rise to the top. I think <laughs> one a little more in your era maybe uh, Corey uh, won it too. Uh, yeah, two thousand two thousand and seventeen. So. If anybody remembers the year 2017 as it relates to the UKC World Hunt, that was the year that the UKC World Hunt was re-ran. And that's kind of, uh, you know, something that hasn't been seen in the history of the uh, of U- UKC events or especially the UKC World Championship. Um, and in the rerunning of the UKC World Championship, a black and tan female, a seven-year-old black and tan female, Champion Grand Knight Champion PR Nelson's Northern Roxanne uh, was victorious. She was owned by Patrick Stewart and Bobby Talley. Well, you mentioned 2017, and and I, I go back one year earlier. I was privileged to judge the UKC World Show Championship in Greencastle, Indiana, and the final two dogs got down to a blue tick female, Whitney Killo, and your buddy up there from Pennsylvania, Dave Myers. And yep. I can't remember the name of Dave's dog. You probably do. I I don't know a tremendous Doc. black and tan male. He Just, calls him he calls him Doc. Doc. Okay. Doc wow. Name. And uh those dogs were the final two. And uh on that day, uh Whitney uh, emerged the world champion and Doc was a reserve, but uh just phenomenal and and then you know they continue on uh showing those amazing black dogs and hunting them. So uh Dave and Kelly Myers there from uh, Pennsylvania are are definitely in the thick of it with black dogs today. And Dave Gilman out in Illinois has been a real positive force with black dogs and always popping up in the winter circle one way or the other, you know, and my old bud, uh, all these things come to mind as we start talking about black dogs. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about the breed. Like you, I could, I'd have to take my shoes and socks off to count the amount of, of great people that I've met in that breed. It's, oh, it's yeah. fantastic. So well, you can't go ahead. Well, I, I saved this story for the, for uh, our conversation about the common era, as far as what my experience with black and tan coon hounds has been. Um, I've only owned one in my entire life. Now, when I was a kid, I got started showing dogs by showing um, AKC confirmation shows. So I showed quite a few black and tan coon hounds for, for different people that I knew, different breeders from across the country. That was, that was pretty cool to be able to do that and to learn that way. Um, but the very first black and tan coon hound that I own, um, it, was a calm, it was a collaborative effort between Dave, David Gilman and Philip Heron to get him to my house. Philip Heron's from Arkansas. And anybody that knows Philip, he's always wearing a 10 gallon hat and has a cigar in his mouth <laughs> and overalls on, <laughs> but he's a great guy. And, uh, Philip, uh, at the time I had a Walker female that I was trying to get bred and, uh, she didn't take. And that, and I was at the UKC youth nationals that day that she was supposed to have puppies and she didn't have any puppies. And, I was I was sitting there talking with Philip Heron and telling him how disappointed I was that I wasn't going to have a pup to train this fall. And Philip said, well, he said, I can remedy that situation. He's like, I've, I've got a litter of pups that will be ready to go at Autumn Oaks. He said, it's, it's out of one of David Gilman's stud dogs, and I'm really having high hopes for this litter. So I'd love to just give you one. And I, I him hawed around about it and, and, and all that. And, and finally I called Philip up and I said, yeah, you've talked me into it. I'll pick him up at Autumn Oaks. It was a, it was a male puppy. So I ended up picking the puppy up from, from David Gilman and I brought the pup home and I'll tell you what, he didn't last long at my place. I could not break that sucker to barking. Couldn't break him in the kennel barking. And we didn't get along for that reason. 
And unfortunately, that pup found his way out real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, Philip, uh, as I'm looking here at this copy of the American Black and Tan Coon and Hound Association yearbook, 1972, <laughs> at the top of the page inside is the name Philip D. Heron. Philip oh. gave me this book. I see Philip every year when I go to Arkansas. He always comes over and visits with us and sometimes, uh, you know, hunts with us. But his grandson, Kevin, uh, usually makes a habit of hunting with us several nights uh, while we're there. Philip is a guy that has a real passion for the youth and has done a lot of good work with the Black and Tan Association. And I don't know anybody that works harder for their association than he he does uh you know, he sold me a membership <laughs> to, the, to the association. I was getting those yearbooks year every year at the White River. He'd say, "Well, you guess I guess you know what I'm going to ask you next. You <laughs> pay your dues." And uh, he well, says, you know, that, yeah. "I met I met Philip uh, at I think it was at my very first Black and Tan. Well, it wasn't my very first Black and Tan days, but it was my very first Black and Tan days working as a UKC associate." Um, that was out in Flora, Illinois at Charlie Brown state park. And I'll tell you what black and tan days, man, if you want to go and you want to see a lot of coon dogs at one time, you got to go to black and tan days. My Lord, I've never seen so many black and tans. I haven't seen that many coon hounds in my lifetime at an event. It's just crazy. Yeah. They've always been, they, they're breed hunter on Thursday night back in in my tenure was typically 300 and more dogs on a thursday night yeah uh, and and that was before it was even a licensed hunt that was before the days of the uh breed rqes you know back in that day they just had a breed hunt usually on friday or uh, thursday night that was non-licensed yeah the mecca of coon hunting flora illinois Amazing place. If you ever get a chance to go to Charlie Brown Park, go in the headquarters building there where the kitchen is and just look at the plaques around the wall there and see how many major events that club has held. World yes. championships of every stripe, breed days, plot days, black and tan, I'd say, would probably be the two um, that they've held the most. But uh, amazing club there. So many names come to mind there of people that, uh, you know, that just uh, were so engaged in coon hunting, so much a part of the history. You know, folks, the reason we talk about this history of these breeds and all, for me, is to honor those that have laid the foundation who have paved the way who without these people we would we wouldn't be having this conversation we would not be having podcasts and vi youtube channels and and you know media companies being formed and all the things that are going on in our sport today we wouldn't have it without these pioneers. Dal Johnson is a black and tan figure that I remember very well from Fairfield, Illinois, just south of Flora. Daryl liked his mules. He would often be seen on the grounds at Flora riding a mule. Uh, uh, died in the wool, black and tan fancier. Uh, there's just so many, so many names and and important personalities. They were weren't all charismatic and 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 uh, uh, flamboyant like Willie Davis. Some of them were very quiet and humble individuals, but they loved that breed. And they, my old hunting buddy in Michigan, Bud Bauer. His hearing had been wrecked by the steel or the paper mills in Kalamazoo. He was a farmer. He loved the black and tan. He had some long-eared dogs that he'd gotten from 
uh, Bobby Keister up in, in northern Michigan when I first went up there, and they were old, and Bud had quit, and I brought him out of retirement. And man, did the, the stories he could tell about hunting with those old black and tans. It's our heritage, guys. It's our foundation. It's our roots. And to me, it's just very, very important. And if you don't enjoy listening to it, that's the beauty of these things, these podcasts or whatever. All you got to do is flip on by and go listen to, a, you know, the boys in South Carolina talk about Bigfoot. That's fun, too. <laughs> but, you know, I just love the history. That was I, I'm an, just that, a history that was, buff. That was an ironic choice of words using Bigfoot, because if I'm not mistaken, there was a there was a prominent stud dog named Bigfoot in the black oh, yeah? and breed at one time. <laughs> was he a black dog? Oh, yeah, he was a black oh, dog. Yeah. So. All right. All right. <laughs> well, now they want them with those little tight cat feet. You know, mm-hmm. yep, sir. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, I full heartedly agree with you there, Steve. You know, it's so interesting to get in behind these breeds that uh, we commonly see and that are used in the sport today and, and just see where they came from, what it took to get them there. Talk about these prominent people that put in so much work and devotion into making these breeds what they are today. And my big, my big, uh, my big thing with the history behind these breeds is we're, we have to be good stewards of what we've been given. And in the art of stewardship, we have to have these kinds of conversations and we have to re recant these stories so that people will know about them and that there's record of what has been and what will forever be because of these people. And that's, that's where, that's where my soul is invested in even having a conversation about the black and tan coonhound breed, because it's just as important as having a conversation about any of the other breeds. Oh, absolutely. And this narrative could easily be, you know, we could change the names and change the color of the dogs and, we could have these same discussions and we plan to about the other breeds. Uh, But, you know, these, these pioneers, they had goals and they had purpose and they had pride in these breeds. And I guess that's why I'm not a great big crossbred X bred fan. I'm a purebred guy. Uh, I love to look at the history of these breeds and I know the dedication that went in to the building of these dogs and these people that we've mentioned, these personalities, they were totally dedicated. No, were there some guys that slipped off behind the barn and bred old, old bruiser to, a to an, a, another breed? Absolutely. DNA came along and helped resolve a lot of those issues. You know, but I'm just not a big crossbred guy. I just, I just look at the foundation that's been built, and I'm always, you know, with my own breed, I'm always looking to improve the dogs. But I prefer to do it within the guidelines and the boundaries of a given breed. Now that might not be your cup of tea. You know, you guys out there that are listening, you may think, well, what I want to do is, I want to improve my ideas and of improving is by going outside and just breeding to a good coon dog. Well, let me tell you this. There are good coon dogs within the breed if you just look for them and search them. Yes. The, the mention I made of Hans Wagner, I thought it was interesting where uh, the article talked about how he was willing to go out and find these good these good dogs to breed to. You know, they're out there. You just got to do do your work. You know? and, the, and even those that, that are utilizing a crossbred program or, or actively crossbreeding their dogs, they deserve to know the history behind the breeds that they're utilizing, too. Oh, yeah. So that way they For can sure. understand the math equation that they're producing. Well, listen, I want to be very, very clear. I am not condemning anybody that chooses 
to crossbreed. The thing about the X-breed dogs and all, it brought it out to light, some of the things that were being done in the dark. And I, I applaud that. And if that's the route that someone chooses to take, then I'll fight for your right to do that. You know, the registry has said they will accept them, and so be it. You know, I'm just simply stating my personal preferences. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Groover, what say you? We uh, kind of put a bow on this podcast. We've been at it about an hour and 35 minutes. Do we have anything else we want to talk about? Do we want to talk about well, anything off of uh, off of the web? Uh, interesting questions that have popped up on coon hunting conversations or anything of that nature? Or you want to just uh, go to bed? Well, I think bed's calling my name, but I, but before we sign off, I will, I will add that, uh, you know, having these kinds of conversations about the specific breeds is a good thing. And I think that it, it always generates thought provoking conversation that takes place outside of what we're recording here today. And I think this is a good starting point where we can we can continue the conversation, possibly at a later date, um, if if that's what our viewership should uh, should desire of us. But they we're can't gonna... see us, Corey. <laughs> I say that all the time. They can't see it. I have personally, I have a face for radio. Yeah, but. <laughs> Oh. I just kidding. It's late, brother. No, no. But uh, carry on. Continue, please. Yeah. So hopefully we can we can even continue this conversation about the black and tan breed. Uh, but we're going to try to bring the other stuff too. We're going to talk about the English dogs. We're going to talk about the Walker breed. We're going to talk about plots. Even uh, we're going to imagine try to hit, that. Yeah, I know, right? We're going to hit the gauntlet, and I hope that uh, you guys will send us your feedback. And, and tell us how we're doing. Well, absolutely. And I've always been told since I started down this podcasting road that the breed uh, discussions or, or information is enjoyed. So we hope you enjoyed our our ramblings around with the old, uh, well, you know, there's an, uh, a real famous uh, dog named Tennessee Rambler. Uh, I saw on Facebook, and I can't, I'm glad I thought of this, and I didn't mention his name yet, but you can't mention black and tan coonhounds without mentioning an old pard. Do you know who pard is? Oh, I'm Corey? not familiar with pard, no. Tam Young is 85 years old. Tam Young is has been one of the most influential black and tan hunters and breeders of all time. He was a, a tugboat captain on the waterways there in Mississippi and Ohio. There, and he's from Western Tennessee, I believe, Adamsville. His son, uh, Clay, has followed in his dad's footsteps. Uh, great friends and close to Barry Kitty of Trin Walker fame. Wipeout dogs. Uh, but Tam Young is one of the greatest guys that I've ever met in my life. Love every minute I've been able to spend with him and talk to him. He's the only coon hunter that I know that calls me Steven. <laughs> he call, everybody else calls me Steve. He calls me Steven. And uh, just love him to death. And happy birthday, Tam. I hope you're doing great. And I hope to see you soon. Oh, what a way to end the podcast, man. That's great. All right, folks. I think we've shined the tree for tonight. This old black dog here's about barked out. He's getting a horse. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to keep flipping one of these halls I've been sucking on here throughout this. Uh, we've got old Bruiser tied old up back, Bruiser. and now we've got old uh, old old and gray <laughs> tied up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I couldn't mention Tam Young without mentioning he was a guy that got into uh, that crossbred pool a little bit with his old his rock dog 
was a Walker Black and Tan Cross, a single registered dog that was a fame in hard rock. He was a famous, famous winner. At one time was leading uh, the, the all-time money leaders in PKC. So there's room for everybody under the tent, folks. Uh, come on in. You're welcome here. And uh, if somebody asks you where I am and where's Corey these days, He's out there trying to find that black and tan puppy let go because he heard he's a world beater now and he's trying to get him back. (laughs) He really is, too. (laughs) As for me, I've just gone to the dogs. Good night, folks. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.